got this right here. We'll stop for a sec. I always like to point out this tree. Um, this is a hawthorn. Uh, this is downy hawthorn, which is a Crataegus mollus. Um, what I wanted to show you is that this tree is like totally hollow and and trees can survive like that for many, many, this has been like this for the last 30 or 40 years, okay? Uh, we lost this one limb because it doesn't, you had, it came out this way uh, from snow load, it broke off. Now, if it had a solid heartwood in it, it probably wouldn't have happened, but that's, it, that's what's, the heartwood is there to support the tree. It's like your bone structure. Uh, but, and if you were to girdle some of this, this is where all your, this cambium layer, which is right underneath the bark, is what actually translocates water to the rest of the tree. So if you were to cut that, certainly the tree would die. It's like your, your veins of, the, of, of your body. So it just shows you that this can hold itself up with all those stresses being hollow as well. Uh, but if you were, the only way, it's easier to kill the tree if you were just to chop a short, cut, thin girdle around that tree. You're cutting off its its blood, you know, its blood veins to the house, to the top of the tree. Okay, this gets white corn, a cluster of flowers, and a large uh, apple about the size of a, a large marble. Um, so it's very showy. It's not really uh, a tree that you. I mean, it's not a great tree for your for your yard only because it's it's kind of very messy. Um, it has thorns or long cockspur type thorns on it as well. So, um, but it's structurally, it's a beautiful tree. Um, it's not in the market as far if you were to go to a, a nursery and ask for this particular tree, you probably wouldn't find it because there's a lot of cultivars out there, hybrids um, that were grown for its flower or its fruit or structure. So this is one of the old species. Oh, that's this was here, um, probably around 18, you know, the 1900 or so. Wow. You know, when this carriage house was built. So. Okay, there's a couple uh, smaller uh, trees through here that can be considered a shrub or small tree. Um, this particular tree right here, multi, it can be multi-trunked or you can see multi-branch very low, almost like a shrub, but you can train it to be more of a tree. This is fringe tree. Um, it's a nice smaller tree for, for your landscape. Um, it gets, uh, it's a, has a simple leaf. Um, it gets these white uh, feathery flowers that kind of droop. They're very fragrant. Um, it's a native. It'll, it'll survive in some wetter areas as well as dry. Uh, really no pest problems at all to it. Um, it gets a berry, sorry? Oh, it's fringe which is uh, Chinanthus virginicus, okay, it's, it's a native. There is a Chinese one like it too, the bark is slightly different, same kind of flower, uh, but this is a nice, you know, smaller tree for, you know, for a landscape at a, at a home, okay. And then the tree next to it, to the, to the right there, these are old ones, they're getting kind of gnarly looking, but they're, that's a Japanese snowbell. They, they do bleed a lot in the spring, like, uh, like dogwood, if you were to prune it in the spring, or maples, anything like that. Um, but it gets a, uh, it's again, a simple, a simple leaf. Um, it gets a, a, a little droopy bell flower, so a Japanese snow bell. Uh, blooms in the late spring. Um, and then it does get a little berry on it as well. It just stays green. Uh, but that's a nice small tree, too, that'd be great for, for a small landscape in a home. And then we have This is, a, this is actually a seedling from that tree right here, uh, which is the Chinese red bud, okay, which is Circus, Canada, Circus chinensis. Has this uh, silvery bark. It grows different than, the, than our native uh, red bud, which is uh, Circus canadensis. Uh, and I'll show you one of those later. And it's just quite a, a different structure to them as, as well. The chinensis, uh, has more low branching, can be multi-trunked like this one over here is. 
Um, so it's not as tall, it's like a big, um, large round shrub. It's flowers all along the stems. That's what these little, little buds are here throughout, like, like our native, our native uh, red bud. Heart-shaped leaf, uh, kind of leathery, a little, little thicker leathery feeling to this than it is to our native, all right? And so this is a larger, this is where this one actually seeded here. I gotta, I'll probably dig it and, and move it out of that spot there. You can see all the seed pods hanging here, okay? So it can see, we had some problems with, you had, again, we have heavy snows. I think a lot of it broke at the bottom. This was gonna really need to have some major pruning done on it. Um, but um, otherwise, it's very full of flowers in, in, in spring, okay? They're, they're, they're uh, like a purple, pink, dark pink purple, okay? Whereas our native red bud, there's white, there's a lot of different uh, cultivars that are out there for our native red bud, which is Cerasus canadensis, which grows more like a dogwood would, like a flowering dogwood, more of a tree, small tree. And then one of my favorite trees is this tree here, and there's actually, there's three of them right in a row here. Um, this is the Katsura tree. Uh, it's native to Japan, Korea. Um, it is related to the red buds, okay? It has, it has a heart-shaped leaf. It flowers all along the stems like, like our red bud, okay? It's called Circidophyllum japonica. So again, you have that name, there's Circus and Circidophyllum. So they are related. This obviously they get much larger than, than our red buds do. And just note the bark. Uh, on this tree when they get old like that, it's beautiful. Um, they, the one thing that they don't like is to be, uh, they don't tend not to handle drought very well. And we've had those periods of drought, like several years of drought, and they were starting to die back. Uh, but they did make it through that, and uh, otherwise it's, it's a beautiful tree. When, uh, when fall comes around, the, the leaves turn a, a nice yellow color. And as they're falling, they're, they're, the leaves give off a nice fragrance. They smell like vanilla. Really nice. It's really nice. So it has a lot of interest all year round. The, the, the flowers will come out pretty soon. They'll, we'll go buy it. It has these two little like feathers that come out, and they're, they're red. They're very inconspicuous, but when, uh, especially these way they were placed, so here the sun comes up on the east here and you come drive up the road and, it, and when you catch it at the right time it's all red just bright red because that sun is hitting those all those little flowers so, and they don't last very long here they come and they go real quick uh, the, the common name is katsura yeah and that's available on the, the nurseries you know i planted two in my yard and you know like i said that's one of my favorite trees it's a, they tend they like to grow kind of upright so it's it's nice that way too they don't get real broad Some of the conifers that uh, one of my favorite again is uh, this is this conifer here. This is a uh, Oriental spruce. This is just a species. Um, has has shorter needles, very glossy. They're soft. They're not really you know spiny like uh, like most people have like uh, you know the blue spruce, Colorado blue spruce is very stiff and and sharp. Um, this is a very nice uh, specimen tree. There's a lot of cultivars of this particular tree, and I'll show you one that's that's named for Skylands. Um, they have there's weeping forms and there's vestigial forms, that, that kind of thing. So, but a beautiful uh, a beautiful conifer. Then otherwise, just using uh, most people use the, the uh, Norway spruce with Spicea abies, which is very common. It's almost like a native, even though originally it's not a native to the to the to this country. They were brought in, but they naturalized, and they, you know, so they've kind of been called a native at this point. So this little collection in here, different conifers. Some you have compact forms. We have a weeper. This is actually a weeping form. Most people think of weepers as something that kind of flows on the ground, um, but you see how the branches are drooping down. That's actually a, a weeping form. Sometimes they're staked so that they can grow straight and they will eventually just go straight. Uh, but this one is a Serbian spruce and you can kind of see it has, you have the, 
kind of a blue and a green together. Because if you just, uh, the screen on top and blue underneath, it shows that in different blotches throughout the whole tree. Uh, but this again, is an, it's, it grows like a bean pole because all those branches are just weeping downward to create that. That's a nice specimen right there. And then right in the back here, you see on the ground here, very low growing. Part of it is the snow helped it out a little bit too, kind of pat it all down, but it does come up a little higher, maybe two or three feet max. Uh, that is cephalotaxis. Um, it's related to the taxis or, or ewes that most people would plant in their front yards. Um, this is cephalotaxis harringtonia prost prostrata. Okay, so it's prostrate, it grows flat. What's nice about it is that the deer don't don't nibble on it or don't touch it um, for 90% of the places that I've seen it. I mean, sometimes they'll say something's deer, the deer don't bother it here, and then someone will say, well, I have it at my house in Bergen County somewhere, and the, the deer are eating it. Well, sometimes that'll happen, I mean, but um, for the most part, it's, it's deer resistant. So, and there's a, there's a fastidiate form, which means it's upright. There's a couple different forms of that as well. So that's a great plant for people that have problems with deer, which most people do anymore. And then the tree right behind it there, that's a magnolia. Um, that's a yellow flowering magnolia called butterfly. So it's a really nice one because you don't find a lot of, of magnolias that are, that are grow up that are yellow. Um, so they've been crossing a different couple different species of, of uh, magnolia with Selengiana, which we'll see over here, which is a saucer magnolia. Uh, to get a yellow form of that, so. Um, I kind of placed it in there because sometimes magnolias need a little protection from the wind, uh, especially when they are blooming early with those buds, they get, they get burnt from uh, cold snaps that we get at night. You know, the, the flower buds will start to open. Usually it happens with Selengianas because they bloom right at that cusp where, you know, sometimes it's, it's warm during the day and then it drops to freezing at night and then those buds freeze and then you don't get any flowers. They just, they just flop to drop off and fall to the ground. So when, you're, when they're protected, they tend to, but they'll still bloom because they've got some protection from wind and that kind of thing that will keep them basically warm. The magnolia? Oh yeah, yeah, no, I, yeah, we put that in, yeah. Well, it's just a different, it's just, this is a different species. This is a different species of spruce. It's called Sir. Hmm? Well, I mean, why is that way? Um, <laughs> that's a tough question. I don't know why, why is there different species though? Because there's like differences, like people are different. So a species, this is all related to the, to the pine or to the spruces. So it's a Picea, which is the genus. So if you were to look at it, at a plant, I, I can show you a label. Like I say, a Picea orientalis, which is that one over there. And then there's, a, this is also Picea, which is a spruce. They're all members of one family. Okay, that's the family. Their genus is part of that larger group. Okay. And then as you break it down to species, there's more, peop more different types of species within that family of spruces. You know what I'm saying? I don't, I don't know. I mean, sometimes, yeah, I mean, it's... No, I don't, I really don't know. I mean, it's just the way that, that you know, I, I, I don't have an answer. Well, it's possible some of the new growth on it here, you get some little blue on the ends, okay? And then sometimes it's, it's the, it gets more sunlight. Certain ones will, will turn yellow, like I'll show you ones that, if it doesn't get exposed to sun, it stays green, but if it's in the sun, it gets more yellow because they cast to it because it needs that sunshine. Um, but yeah, it seems to be more on the tips. So, I mean, why do you have it? Sometimes it's mutations, but yeah, see, it's all under, it's all the underside of the needles that are that are has that glauca blue. Yeah. So when it blows around, it's kind of neat that that's. Uh, so that's Picea omarica pendula. So omarica would be the species and then pendula is the form or cultivar. Yeah, there's a lot of things with that.
We have more magnolias over here. This is a magnolia as well, which we want to think it doesn't look like a magnolia. This tree right here. And then there's a bigger one on the other side of that tennis court over there, larger than this one, but it's the same, same species. And this is cucumber magnolia. And you can see how large they get. They get even bigger than the one that's over on the other side there. It looks like a big oak tree. I mean, it has this big, you know, like a white oak or something, because it has that big, broad canopy, very heavy branched. Um, so you can see a lot of the, a lot of debris here. These are the, these are the seed pods. They're, they're green when once it flowers, it gets a very pale yellow flower on it uh, when the leaves are already out. So you don't notice it as much. Uh, and then it'll go to seed. You have these, these are green, and inside here, you see they're open now. There's, there's, there would be a, a, a seed inside of that that's red, in a, like a berry. And these will, these will ripen. And but when they're green, they look like a cucumber. So you have to, that's what they call cucumber. It's like lumpy, like a cucumber would be. Uh, and then once they, once they ripen, they'll drop. The, the uh, this cover opens up, and and it's red. Okay, they have these red berries in it, and the animals like it, or, or the, it's a seed inside, so. And it has large flower, or large leaf. Um, and there's a couple, I think there's a couple cultivars of that as well, but what we have here is more, just the species, okay. So again, that's um, Magnolia cuminata, which is the uh, cucumber magnolia. No, it blooms later, like, like you know, the Selengianas, which is that one over there, the saucer magnolia, which a lot of people have in their yards. In the year, sometimes the buds get frozen because it's an early bloomer. Um, there's one other one, which is a stellata, which is star magnolia, which is a smaller statured tree. That has a hardier, seems to be a hardier uh, buds on those because they bloom early too, and they never seem to get frosted like Selengiana does. I've heard things called tulip trees. Yeah. Is that a totally different tree from magnolia? Oh, it's, yeah. It's a similar looking flower. Yeah, the flower looks similar to it, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's a, like a, a totally different. Yeah, we'll, we'll see a couple of those okay. too, yeah. yeah. This is uh, Magnolia Selengiana. This one has there's several colors, variations in, in the Selengianas or saucer magnolia. Um, this one has like a pale pink. You can get up to a dark purple flower on the, they've, they've hybridized those over the years. Um, full of, full of, these are all flower buds on here, these fuzzy fat buds on there. Um, they've already starting to get a little dark, which sometimes means that they're getting a little too cold or frosted, uh, but they haven't cracked open yet, so the flowers should still be okay. Um, and this will just be full of flower. You can see there's nothing but flower buds on that. That's, and one thing that's cool about this tree, the original plant is way back in there. like. That you can see it way in the back, and it had it had to keep reaching out to get more light, so it's kind of been walking itself out. So it it, it, it layered it, it dropped a branch down, and it layered over there, and then this one dropped some more, and it, now it's it's actually rooting out here. So it's like it's actually moving itself out to get more light because of these spruce trees all around it. On the other side here, yeah. that's a that's a crab apple, the big one right here. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's a that's a crab apple. Um, they get most people think the crab apples taste kind of small, but they do get that. That's probably the mature size of that. That's a big one. I don't. I'm not sure exactly which species that is. I haven't really looked it up. Um, but it's it's it's, it's, an, it's in the malice family, so it's a which is an apple. Okay, so it gets small little berries on it. People always ask that at the concert. Oh. Okay, here we have some uh, deciduous trees, which are, are is actually our conifers. And the reason why they're conifers is because they get a cone as their seed, so that's, they're in that family of, of conifers. These are taxodium disticums, which is called bald cypress. And because it, it gets bald in the wintertime, it dro drops all its, all its needles, they're all laying here on the ground. Um, It'll grow in some wet areas. It'll actually set, set up little knees if it had to, uh, but it'll, it'll survive in, in, in drier locations as well. Um, and I have right behind it a, a, a dawn redwood, which are related, 
and they kind of look alike, but there's differences in the bark, the color of the bark, and how the buds come out at either at either right angles or they're, they're spiraled around. So that, that's what the differences are in a lot of these, okay? So these two, you can notice the bark on it. It's kind of a, a grayish bark. Um, this one has a nice, the, 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 uh, the root flare is kind of flaring out. It's, you know, this one's doing very well. Same thing with that one. And this gets wet in here during the spring. Um, if last year it was like wet all season. We had so much rain last year. Uh, but they don't mind that at all. This area here tends to get wet. Um, but this one, you don't really see the you have, have to treat the branches too high up to point out the uh, how the buds are on each stem. Okay, they, they use their, their the buds on a uh, ball cypress kind of uh, come out flat on either side at, on you know on right angles. Whereas then we'll show you a uh, this is a dawn redwood over here. Again, here's another, this is another oriental spruce. And actually see these are sending up, here's a, there's a knee right there that's popping up from probably one of these guys over here. And this is, this is a dawn redwood. You can see the difference in the color. This has more of a reddish bark, kind of a uh, very flaky, soft bark on it. And these the smaller stems, they really flake off. They're very, and it's like papery, okay? And it gets a different, you know, it gets these sinewy kind of trunk to it. And we have a much larger one down in the Pinetum, which is this big around, and it has these indentations in it. It's really kind of uh, medieval looking to me. It just looks, so, uh, which it is. It's a, it was a tree that was discovered, and you thought it was, it was, it was disappeared. But this tree was discovered in China in the 1940s. Uh, you know, China stopped, didn't want anybody coming into their country for exploration, and they did eventually in 1940, it was discovered again and it was brought back to the States. Um, the one that, the, the, there's another seedling over on the other lawn over there, that's also, a, a, that's that one you were talking about. That's also um, a Dawn Redwood. And that's from, that's a seedling from one of the original plants that was brought from China in 1940, which was planted in, in uh, uh, Willow Wood, which is down in Ch uh, Peapack, which is part of the Morris County Park system. And that was obtained by, uh, by one of these uh, collectors down there, and they planted it down there, and that tree is like this big around. Um, so that's the seedling of that. This one I got as a, a seedling from uh, somebody in Ringwood, actually. They had a, a big tree in their yard, and this one was growing next to it. It was just a seedling there, and they didn't, they didn't want to just kill it. So I just went over there, I dug it up, and put it here. And it's, uh, they grow very fast once they get going. Okay, that nice right along the little road there? And a nice, yeah. This one? Uh, I got it when it was like this big. Uh, maybe 20 years, something like that, maybe. I don't remember when I put it in. I should have. It seems like yesterday, but no. no. <laughs> yeah, it, it's like quick goes. Um, yeah, but it's, it likes this area. It gets you know, plenty of water through here. So I guess we can walk through here. I don't think it's too bad. This is uh, the other one I mentioned. This is uh, Picea orientalis. This one is uh, called Aurea Skylands. But I just wanted to stop here first is because you walk around the other side and it's all yellow. It doesn't get a lot of the sunlight on this side. Uh, but you can see there's a little, little bit of yellow in it in little spots. But you take a walk around the other side and it gets all that sunlight. And it gets, all the tops are yellow. 
because it gets all the suns. This is the original plant, so this is available in the nurseries now, you know, pretty, and it's a very popular tree. Uh, I've, I've got several them planted around here now. Um, what is this called? This is uh, Picea orientalis uh, aurea skylands. This is, it's the, that, this, the original plant is this one right here. So we went to a garden center and saw them there. That's derived from this plant. It was discovered here and named, named for skylands. So yes, it has a, uh, this is the most yellow golden of all, you know, there's other ones out there, which is like one called just all, all gold or something like that. But the Skylands one is the one that's really stands out as the most color, you know, the uh, most golden, it's got the color yellow. So, oh. okay, we're gonna move this way. I wanted just to show you that. Yeah, this is that one that was a seedling. I put it in here. I didn't, I didn't wrap it or anything. I didn't think the deer would bother it, but of course they did. Several years in a row, they busted it all. I mean, they just were racking it, you know. <laughs> so I've been trying to straighten it out again. It's... Uh, so the deer will, will chop a little dip at that one? Well, no, they're actually rutting, you know. Oh, I see. And usually they just like to do like a, anything that's like a bean pole. They like to get those nooks and crannies cleaned out, but... I guess they like this kind of, it's like a bottle brush and they just, they just do this kind of thing and they rip the, they just busted the whole thing up. Well then they, then a then the storm, I don't know whether that was from a storm or what, but then the top broke out of it. And so now I'm trying to, this I'll cut off and I'm trying to, this is gonna be the new terminal or leader. So I have to kind of cut other things back so it doesn't, what'll happen is these, if one of these doesn't become a central leader, one of these other ones down below here will say, well, I'm gonna hurry up and go, and it's gonna make the tree all lopsided and everything, so I'm trying to straighten it out, because that's what happened down there. There's a leader coming out there, so we see how we chopped it back to get that to, to go, so. Yeah, and then you have to deal with the animals and everything. Keeping with the dawn redwood and the and the uh, bald cypress, and this is a giant sequoia. This tree right here. So that's a sequoia dendron giganteum, and this one is a cultivar uh, called uh, Hazel Smith. Hazel Smith had a her and her husband had a a nursery uh, called uh, the, the Watnong Nursery in uh, I think it was Oakland or somewhere in that area over there. I forget where exactly, in New Jersey right here. Um, and the seedlings that they had seemed to be hardier than, they're, they're not quite super hardy in this area. This one has a bluer cast to it than, than the, just a species. Uh, and it's, they, they seem, it seems to be a little more hardy than, than just a species. Okay, gets more of a bluish cast to the, to the needles. Uh, we have another large one, which is right over there. It's been pruned up and you can see the trunk that brownish red trunk straight ahead where that red car just went by. That's a, that's a sequoia dendron there also. That one's not the Hazel Smith though. And then I planted another one down the road a little ways, which was, I, I brought it back here from when I was out in California. It was in a tube and anyway, it's, it's about, I don't know, 14 feet tall now, but it's, it tends to die back like this one, depending on the, the weather, there's a lot of brown down the bottom, but it's it's all gonna it's fine. It's just that you may have to prune up some of those lower lower limbs on there. Um, also, the bark is very thick and like spongy. Um, it's very thick. It's probably several inches thick. Um, and the reason why they needed that, if and out you know out in where in its native woodland there, they would when they would needed fire for the the seed to. Uh, break its, you know, scarify it for it, because the seed coat is so hard that it needed fire to break it so that it can germinate. So having, that was an adaptation to, to protect the tree from getting scorched. The, the, a fire would come, come through and it would kind of just smolder and, and, and not burn right through the tree. So it would, that was protection for the tree. It's, it's uh, flame retardant stuff on there, so. So, but it needed that again, so you could, you can, uh, propagate. propagate itself. What's yep. It this tree here, so Sequoia dendron giganteum. So giant sequoia. 
No, it's a small, it's not that big. Yeah, well, it's a seed, it's, yeah, it's a, the seed inside the cone. Yeah, because it's very hard seed coat on there. Oh yeah, they grow, you know, there's, you're thinking that there's redwood also, which is related to the, 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 the meta sequoia, which is that one over there with the ball, the, the dawn redwood. Then there's redwood, which is, that's, that's uh, that one's not hardy out here at all. So you can't really grow them out here. Oh yeah, the ones that you, yeah, they're, they're gigantic, yeah. So. <laughs> well, that is, that is an ash tree, which is now turned into a uh, uh, English ivy tree. Oh, well, that's why it looks like that, okay. It's all English <laughs> ivy. Okay. And you can see the, tr the I mean, there's, there's a trunk of English ivy on there. Oh, okay. I mean, the other one over there, these are all dying out, and they've they got to be removed. More or less, that's probably going to go too, so. Yeah, I don't know. Somebody chopped it on the bottom there. I can see that somebody put a cut through that one there for some reason. But anyway, yeah. Well, ash trees are having their issues. I think most people know about that. Right here, this one was volunteered itself here from seeds from one of our a lot of. We have a lot of this particular species of tree. It seeds itself in the woods and everything. We. Uh, there used to be just Euonymus here, I chopped it out, and this has been growing here, we kind of left it. This is uh, Prunus suppertella pendula, which is the Higgin cherry, very hardy. It's not a grafted cherry, like most of the Japanese cherries are grafted on, a, on an understock. So uh, this, is, this is from its own roots. Uh, it'll bloom, it gets beautiful little pale pink flowers, you know, throughout the whole tree. Uh, has a nice structure to it, and we have, like I said, lots of them planted throughout the gardens here. And they get quite large. We have a couple really big ones over towards the manor house. <clears throat> Another magnolia. That's I mentioned the star magnolia. It's that guy in the back here with the, the fuzzy buds again. Okay. That's star magnolia, white flowers. It looks like they, when the flowers open, they, the petals open up real wide and it kind of looks like a star. And they're white because the petals come out this way. They don't stay like a cup. Um, and you can see it, this, the stature of that tree is much smaller. It doesn't get real big and heavy. All right, and then the one way behind there is a mimosa. Um, I don't know, everybody, everybody familiar with mimosa trees? It has the, those fuzzy pink flowers, look little fuzzy, I don't know how to describe it, but they're kind of pink and they're just all fuzz. Um, the hum hummingbirds love it. There was a big one over by the, that greenhouse over there, which has slowly been dying out. So that's a seedling of that over there. So um, it has uh, uh, compound leaves, small compound leaves. Um, it's it's, it's semi-hardy up here. It says, you know, depending on its location. This is pretty, uh, the problem is that we have this in here, which I keep having to pull out. This is a uh, bittersweet, see the little berries? Birds love it, poop it out everywhere. And, so, and it always falls, you know, if they're in the trees and things, they, of course they make their droppings in there and you've got to climb in there to try to get the root out. But anyway, uh, the plants that are here, a nice little grouping. Um, this particular one here, okay, this is a uh, Pieris japonica. And this is just a species. There's a lot of cultivars out there that have, like it has a pink flower or has a variegated leaf or there's a dwarf. Um, but this is deer resistant here too. The deer don't bother. See, it's starting to flower now. It's gonna be it's blooming if it stays warm. Um, and then next to it here, kind of looks like the same thing, but this is a, this is a mountain laurel. Okay, it's a Calmia latifolia. Um, you can see that these are all flower buds here. Blooms later, uh, midsummer. Uh, gets clusters of you know anywhere from uh, like whitish to deep red. There's a lot of different cultivars of this as well. 
and and the deer sometimes bother it here, not as much as as uh, like rhododendrons, but we do fence it in, and that's a native too. So this this is not though. This other little plant in here, this thing, you wouldn't really notice it now, but if you come back, uh, I guess that's in mid, I guess late spring, early summer. Uh, this is Harlequin Glory Bower. Um, it gets a uh, very fragrant flower on it. Um, uh, it has, how do I describe it? It's kind of little, little, uh, little flowerets, and then, uh, but it, it, again, it has very, very fragrant. It sometimes will die to the ground if, if it's very, very cold, like in the, you know, below zeros for a while. So, but but the roots remain hardy, and then they would flush up again. So we've, for so far, you can see the size of them. They've been okay for the last several years. Um, and then in the in the fall, when it when the flowers are finished, it gets these berries that are blue with a, a pink uh, sepals around. It's very showy. Okay, uh, it's a nice little plant. It kind of it kind of uh, naturalizes in, cl in clumps. Okay. This is what's that? That's the mountain. This is uh, um, Pyaris japonica, uh, which is or it's called Andromeda. Andromeda. So the name kind of tells it all. I mean, it's got very shaggy bark on it. Peels off in big strips. Um, it, it's a, uh, a compound leaf. Has like five leaf, large leaflets on one stem. So it's kind of a coarse tree. Uh, it does get a, a, a good size nut with a, with a, has a husk around it. So um, you don't want to really have this over your driveway or something, or you know, those things come down, a, or a tin roof or something. Squirrels love them. Yeah, oh yeah, the squirrels love it. Um, and uh, this is a, that's a native tree. It'll grow in wet areas as well. And we have a dead tree name, which this one just passed away, I don't know, last year or so. This was a Camus cypress lawsoniana, which is a, uh, it's a nice tree. I don't know what got into it, but uh, I used to talk about this. They get this, this is called a buttressed, you know, it kind of fattens at the bottom here. There's a buttressed trunk on it. Um, I'm gonna have to take this one down, but um, I didn't really, it, it kind of came all of a sudden. So. I'm sorry? Oh, is there a nest up there? Oh yeah, it could be a squirrel. Yep, because they have another one growing over by the, in the winter garden area, which is fine, so I don't know what happened here. This? This right here, this is burning bush. Euonymus elatus. Invasive, Ter terribly invasive. We got it all over here. It's kind of nice. There is a, they sell it still in, in, in the, you know, in the nursery sell it, but they sell it the compact form, but it, but it still gets the, the, the fruit the birds love and they poop it all over the place. So, but it, yeah, this is invasive. I mean, it's just that this is invasive. I mean, I, I, could, I think we have everything on an invasive list here in Scotland, <laughs> you know. Where is this from? Um, I have to look that up again. I don't, um, yeah, it's, yeah, it is. Yeah, it has these, yeah, the, the bark habit is quite different. That's what they, and this, uh, the, the Euonymus is called burning bush as well. It gets a red, the leaves turn red in the fall. But a lot of these in here in the woods, they kind of just turn pinkish. But if you have it out in the full sun, if it's a, if it's a cultivar that they've, they've bred for it to have that bright red color, you know, then they're bright red in the full sun and they get a nice, you know, so that's why it's called burning bush. This other, this plant also tends to be uh, a little invasive. Um, this is a honeysuckle. Um, it's uh, Lanicera fragrantissima. Very fragrant. I mean, sweet smelling. I mean, it's ready to pop. You know, next probably night next week. So if you were to come by here, you smell that. It's it's really very fragrant. There's a couple up growing up top there. It tends to drop. You know, we, we get seedlings everywhere, kind of thing. But um, it's a nice plant otherwise. You know, the, you know, it's uh, yellow flowers. Very fragrant. The, the leaves are okay, you know. It doesn't, you know, but it's it's got a kind of an interesting bark habit on it. Um, but again, it is a little. It can be invasive, but it's in the honeysuckle. Yep, shrub honeysuckles. Hmm?
What's that? So if you let that go, that would become the honeysuckle vine? No, no, that's just that's different. So again, we have to go back to family and because the, the, the flowers are look like a typical, you know, honeysuckle flower, like on the vine, you know, it has that little, yeah, yeah like same kind of thing. Suckle, same thing. Yeah. <laughs> that they have the same kind of flower that makes it related to the, the you know, so that they're in that family. This is a different species. This is called fragrant, uh, fragmentissima, fra fragrantissima. Okay, and there's a, there's a hundred other ones as well. So, but they're all in that one family of honeysuckle. We're gonna go in here. Now we're stepping into the inner park. The inner park was, it, it's, it's a, you can all come in. We're going to take this walk down this trail here. Um, it is a little overgrown now. We've been trying to trying to open it up a little more. Um, it, it was planted. They had uh, overstory trees, the large maples and oaks and things like that, tulip trees. But then they, you kind of clear the the brush and and planted understory of different types of plants that you wanted to have. So, uh, but over the years, with the lack of you know help getting things cleared out. You have invasives come in and they kind of take over. Um, and we try to, you know, we got to maintain as best we can, but um, but it's all underplanted with, uh, like for instance, back up there, those are those are Kusa dogwoods. Those dogwoods right there, they kind of start to have the, the modeled bark, just, just understory trees up here. And this was planted with daffodils through here. There are some daffodils that still come up in through here. Um, and as we go through, I'll show you a lot of different understory plants, which are really kind of cool. Well, uh, well yeah, you have your canopies, you know, you have your, the, the big trees have formed a big canopy. And then you have understory trees, which have like a second canopy. And then you have, you know, either bulbs or things like that, that are naturalized. And so that's what this whole inner park is about, you know. And you have paths going through it. And this right here is a, this is a white oak right here. Actually, this is, uh, these are gypsy moth eggs right there. Used to be a plaque here. Uh, we do it with, gypsy moth has been kind of controlled. It, they they kind of ebb and flow. You know, years ago we had a big outbreak of it. And then, you know, they went, we use uh, a, a fungus that affects the, the moth uh, in the larval stage and they die it off depending on the weather, if it was moist enough in the spring. So that's been happening over the years. That that fungus kind of stays around, and um, so it's, it's not it's not harmful. It's a natural occurring fungus called Bacillus. And uh, so, but what happens is over the, I guess it gets weakened over time, and you you get a, a a few of surviving adults that lay their eggs, and then you know every it could kind of multiply over the years until to the point it may have an outbreak again. So hopefully you're not, but yeah, these are these are the egg masses. So, and they like they like oaks a lot, and especially white oaks is like one of their favorites. So, what was that, Ken? Does that kill, kill the? Uh... Well, if you can get that off there, yeah, you can kill the eggs. Yeah, I mean you might get a, you know, but once they're off the tree, and you know, they're probably not gonna. But I mean, I'll get along our avenue there, which is lined with red oaks. Every year I get. I, I, now, you know, I see the, 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 they're climbing up. You see these caterpillars when they get to a big stage. But it was nice to see, like last year, they all of a sudden they just they just stop moving, and they just rot right on a tree and fall off. And it's that that fungus attacks them and kills them right there. So so they never get to the adult stage, but some do make it to adult. And then you see the moth flying around, and they'll 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 sit on the tree and lay their eggs. Now this looks like a. Uh, like a, a Kusa dogwood, you know, that, that mottled bark like that, which I'm going to say it's like blotchy, different colors. This one's a Parodia, which is Parodia persica, and it's going to flower soon, which you rarely ever see them unless you really come out here at a certain time. These are the flowers, you can see it's starting to get a little red there. Same kind of little, little uh, if, you're familiar, if, you're, if you're familiar with uh, witch hazels, witch hazels get those little feathers that come out. This kind of has the same thing. This is just starting to pop now. It, 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 it's around for like a week and it's gone. You won't even, sometimes don't notice it. But yeah, it's starting to swell now and uh, has the same kind of leaf as a witch hazel would have. It's related to witch hazel. But I mean, you can't beat that, the structure, the bark. It's a slow growing tree. There's a couple of cultivars out there. Uh, one that's more fastidious growing. Um, 
So there's a few other cultivars of the Parodia persica. And again, there's another one right over here. And this is like in an understory. It does very well in, in the shade over here. And you can see down the little green uh, leaves popping up. There's a sweeps of them over here and then over there. Those are um, colchicum or fall crocus. So they just shoots up all their leaves. They get about, I don't know, six, eight inches high. And it's just leaves and then uh, the leaves die back and then you get your flowers in the fall. So the flowers shoot way up and they're the big, big flowers, big pinkish flowers. So they kind of naturalize in certain areas in here. There's another one right here. Um, it's related to dogwood because of its uh, the, the habit with the, the leaves look the same or similar. The flowers actually are the same because when you, if you look at a flowering dogwood, the center of the flower is yellow and then it has those bracts on it, which actually is not the flower. The flower is the center for a flowering dogwood. The, uh, those white petals are bracts, which are uh, modified leaves actually. So anyways, that's, but everything that's, it is part of, it makes it the flower, it makes the flower, you know, having that obviously. But, so Cornelian cherry, because it does get a berry on it, kind of a, uh, almost looks like a, like a grape, but it's red, very smooth, and the, and the animals eat that right up. Um, and other, other dogwoods do get fruit, like the Kusas get a raspberry looking fruit on it, which is red. Um, but this, most of the most of these are multi-trunk shrubs, larger, you know, large shrubs. Um, this one's in the shade. We have some that are out in the full sun over by the on the other side of the manor house on the terraces there. They get quite large, uh, and they get full of bloom uh, and more sun. So. And that's an invasive. Yeah, you want them. Burning bush, and it's all over. The uh, ILX opaca, little grouping there. Okay, right here we have several things. Um, I mentioned there's um, the Ilex opaca, which is the American holly, that grouping right there is American holly. And then we have these other evergreens here, which has a darker green. Um, these are Chinese holly uh, or Ilex uh, cornuta. Uh, they have a different, the leaf is quite different and dark green. Um, and you can see the kind of habit is kind of, I don't know, it's not a, it's not a great habit to these ones. Uh, unlike the uh, American holly, which kind of has a pyramidal habit. Uh, and then the uh, big tree over here, which gives you the overstory canopy, that's a red oak. And a bark, that's typical of what a red oak would look like. It looks like, uh, actually it was Nancy Bristow, who was one of our, uh, she passed away several years ago. But she used to have ways of thinking of how to remind yourself what that tree is or what this other plant is. So you say, well, it looks like, if you look at it, it looks as though somebody's been skiing down the tree. So that's how she remembers those. She has these little anecdotes to remember things. So, it, so that's how you can tell this is a red oak, okay, by looking at that mature bark, okay. Uh, we also have right here as well, um, what's on the ground here, but then you have, this, these are sweet gums, a couple of them right here. Um, they have a, a, a star-shaped leaf. They get those nice, uh, get these nice seed balls on there. You don't want to walk around in bare feet with these things around. They're kind of spiky uh, and, and they'll fall. Uh, they get full of these seed. Um, the, they get a nice fall color. They, they will tolerate wet sites as well. Um, that's a native. Um, but it's got a nice star-shaped leaf, which is quite nice too. So um, they get very large, as you can see. Why is it called a sweet gum? I don't know. Maybe the bark, maybe either the bark or the there's there's sour wood, there's sour gums. There's probably they, either when they when they if they peel the bark away, there might be a uh, like the sap may be gummy or and sweet. 
you know, there's a lot of, yeah, I don't, I don't know for sure. Is that the same? Uh, yes. Yeah, yep. Yeah, these are sweet gums. And do the animals like to eat those? No, I don't think so. They're pretty good. Uh, oh, yeah, I guess they're hard. Really no, there's just a, there was a seed inside that popped out, but this is just the, just the, the, the house for the seed. Well, there, well, there's a lot of different trees that are, have a like a star-shaped leaf. And then there's the same seed or a little ball. Mm, yeah. yeah. They could just be younger. I don't know. They've been there for about 10 years, but 10 years they've always been the same size. Right? Oh, yeah? Um, I'm not sure. Beautiful leaves and fall and reds. No, it does. Yeah, this one does get that. Oh, you might be thinking of maybe it's a uh, uh, horse chestnut, maybe? Because there's a dwarf one that has gets, you know, it has bigger leaves though. It's, but it's not just a star-shaped leaf though. Star-shaped. Oh yeah. That type of seed mm. or ball. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Is that a seed pot or seed? Yeah, yeah. This is the yeah. This was the, the seed are inside when it opens up, yeah. they fall out. And then there's a sugar maple over here. That's a sugar. And that, that's a typical bark of a, a sugar maple when they get old. Um, kind of flaky bark. That is a witch hazel, related to Parodia persica. Yes, I believe it's a it's, it's a witch hazel, but I, I can't tell whether it's a there's a Japanese witch hazel, there's also the Chinese witch hazel. Because he's one of those. Um, some are fragrant, some aren't. Um, this one I, I I would reach down. It's not very fragrant. But later on in our tour, I'll go to where we have our big collection of, of witch hazels there that are blooming now. And you, there's some fragrance there, and there's all these different species right there as well in one cluster. But you can see how big they can get. It's kind of shady in here, so it's, it's grown into like a small tree. Okay, it tends to sucker at the bottom a little bit, but it probably just is too shady down low, so it doesn't seem to do as well down below. Um, this path will take you up. There's a couple things up here, but a, a tree came down up there over the winter but there's a rock back there and there's a bench. This is part of the inner park trail. And there's, a, there's like a, actually a natural spring right there, right by the rock, it bubbles up. And it runs down the hill along this little stream there. Um, we don't necessarily have to go over there. Um, this, oh, the one back there? Yeah, that's a uh, ironwood or, or carpinus. Um, we have several sort of woods, that's a native. And it kind of has that muscular kind of a smooth bark on there. Yeah, very, uh, it's, it's called ironwood uh, or muscle, muscle tree, I guess. I've, I have another a couple over here and it's a, it's a native. It's, it's Carpinus, um, Carpinus, it'll come to me later. The species, okay, there's several species of, of uh, ironwood as well. It'll come to me, but. And this is actually a yellow wood here. So this has that smooth, thin bark. Yellowwood is also a native tree. Uh, in here, everything is you know, competing for light, so they kind of just stretch way up high. If it was out in the open, it, it kind of has a broad habit. We have some larger specimens of yellowwood uh, over towards the manor house. That's another red oak. You can again, see the ski. Somebody's been skiing up and down that tree right there. Um, let's see what else. Mostly red oaks, and then we have oh, the other one that's the big tree was um, a lot of lot of the uh, sweet gum seed laying down here. There's a bunch of uh, when you look at the trees in the winter. What else are you looking for? You look at the bark. You have to look at the buds on the trees when there's no leaves there to tell what it is. Um, this is, these are old trees, so the bark on this is kind of blocky. These are big old uh, sour woods, or sour wood, which is um, Oxydendron arboreum. And if you look way up high, you can see those little tassels still hanging down. Okay, over here in this direction, there's a whole bunch right in this little, little hill here. Um, it's also called sorrel, sorrel tree, or sorrel wood. 
Um, it, gets, it looks like the uh, Pieris flowers, of uh, Pieris japonica. They kind of have little bell flowers, kind of droop. And that's what you see way up in the trees there, up into where it gets light. You see mostly over in that direction, if you're looking that way. See them all up there, those little tassels? Those are the, those are the seed left over from the flower. Um, it gets a white, like creamy white flower on it. It's a little bit fragrant. But these also get a nice fall color as well. And they're slow growing. It's a nice, you know, for, for a landscape, it's a nice tree, you know. Um, we had one called Globosum, which was in the, um, in the azalea garden behind the house. And that eventually died. I had to take it down. And I haven't had, been able to find that particular cultivar again because that's, it's a cultivar because you'll have your, your genus, which is oxydendron, and your species, which is arboreum, and then your cultivar would be globosum. So it's that whole thing of nomenclature, so that worldwide that is used by everyone, so you know what you're talking about if you're over in China or something. Uh, but when you go, you know, this is, like I said, this a common name could be different anywhere you go. So, so they don't really use a common name technically because that could be misconstrued as something else altogether. So. All right. Uh, I think that's about. So we have a path that goes this way, a path that goes up the hill. You can make, actually you can walk a little bit. We'll walk a little. I just want to show you. When you see the greenery up there on the hill, you can make out the uh, pergola. You can see the pergola up there. So there's another trail. This one, you can go up this way and takes you up to that pergola up there. And there's, some, there's a, really any, there's no benches in there, but uh, you can sit up there and it's, originally that had like a view there because a lot of these trees weren't as quite as large and it was kind of, it, it's, we've cleaned up quite a bit here over the years, but you used to be able to see through here while you're up there on that pergola that had, you know, seating up there. But right now that green that's up there is uh, boxwoods that stay kind of low. All right, so if, if you ever come meandering through here, you can sit at the bench here by the little little spring and take a walk up to the pergola and swing down back that way, or you can head down that direction and hit, hook up to these paths here in the, in the road, which takes you around the back to the wildflower garden and the bog area and then the trails that go up into the woods. And you can always join George on one of his walks, which takes you up to Mount Defiance which is up over there, which gives you a nice view of the whole place. So, lots to see here. You can step away from, huh? Our, our res the reservoirs we use? Yeah. That's way up in the mountain. That's way in that direction. Yeah, yeah, it's a way the distance. Okay, we're gonna have to turn around and head that way. This is uh, allspice, Carolina allspice, which is calicanthus. And you got some of the pods. The seed, you see, they're in these pods, which you, quite quite a few of them. And it kind of it, it kind of um, sends up rhizomes everywhere, and it's very stoloniferous, it kind of colonizes itself in these areas here. Um, it gets a, uh, there's cultivars out there now of this. Um, it kind of has like a yellowish flower, uh, and then there's ones that have a kind of pink, like a pink flower now, and there's a, there's a Chinese form of this. This is a native, uh, very sweet smelling. Um, as you can see, it can thrive in, the, in these understories like that. And, but it does tend to colonize not you know it's not invasive in any way but it does colonize a little bit is that where the all spice, like the spice comes from? you know what i don't know i never really looked into that it might be i don't know i never really looked into it that way i just you know. this is not for a cooking kind of thing i don't know i don't think so i don't think that's the all spice it's probably more of a perennial or something i don't know no for sure um more, we have more kusa, uh, not kusa, katsura trees right here too. There's that one and there's one over there. But the one, the big trees that I mentioned that I like so much, so these are other kusas here. I mean, katsuras, and then there's kusas also down the other end there, which is uh, dogwood. Okay, this evergreen right here 
Uh, this is Lacosawe, um, Oxalis, or I think it's Oxalis. Uh, anyway, this is the common name is Fetter Bush or, or Drooping Lacosawe, kind of droops. Um, it gets, uh, fl uh, flowers will be right here coming out and it has like a little, they droop, little flowers droop, little cream color bell shaped flowers on it. Not really fragrant, uh, but the deer don't bother it here. Um, it stays evergreen. There's a couple of, there's a couple of different cultivars. There's one called Rainbow, which has a multicolored leaf. It sometimes gets burnt if it's in a hot, sunny location during the winter time. Uh, you'll get some of that burning, like see up top there? The leaves will burn off a little bit. I mean, it'll, it'll come back. It just, you know, it looks kind of unsightly for a while. Uh, but if it's in like a protected area, it tends not to do that. But you do get some winter damage here and there. Um, but the, the, there's a variegated form, and then there's a the one called Rainbow, which has several different colors in the leaf. Uh, and, and there's a dwarf one that doesn't get quite as big. I mean, this one, this one it will, will spread. So there were several plants here, and it just kind of spread into a big, big mass planting here. And then right on the other side here, again, this is that, uh, this is that all Carolina allspice. You see the flower, uh, leaves are starting to emerge, and it kind of colonized through here. It's a little more shady here, so that, that really didn't flower that well. And there's a couple seed pods down that way. Um, there's a, this is a white oak right here. And I'll, later on, I'll show you some really big ones that are really quite nice. And you see it has like more of a gray bark, unlike the, the red oak, which is right behind us there. It has those ski marks again on it, different. See, it's a, a far darker uh, the white oak. And as you go up into the canopy, the, the the smaller branches tend to have like, it's like flaking off. And the leaves on that are round lobed. There's no, there's no points on them, whereas uh, the red oak has points on its, uh, on the tips of its leaves. Um, and, and the acorn is, the red, red oak has one of the larger acorns, whereas the, the, the white oak has a smaller acorn. And then this plant right here, which is not doing that well anymore. This, this was a, uh, it's still alive. This is a clethra, it's a Japanese clethra, but it has the uh, same kind of beautiful bark on it again. See, it kind of flakes off and it kind of shows off the different colors in through here. So it's a nice, it'll grow into a small tree if you let it. But it gets, uh, if you're familiar with clethra or sweet shrub, it gets the long white flowers on it, very sweet smelling. And you can see it was, you know, I can't see anything on here, but. Yeah, this is barely surviving in here, but no, there's no flowers on it anymore, but um, it's a nice plant. It does get nice fall color as well, so slower growing than the others. The Clethra ulnifolia grows, doesn't grow quite tall, as tall as this would be. That's a Japanese Clethra. We have lots of them. That's a native. That's the one that has the, uh, the problem, where, or at least it's coming this way. We don't have it here yet which is the um, emerald ash borer. I know it's down in Bergen County, some of the areas down there. Um, there's talk about, you know, going through and just culling all these trees, just chopping them down so that they don't, I don't, I don't, I don't see the point in that, but. Well, well, they, they, they want it, they got to head it off because it, the, the uh, this EAB, emerald ash borer, will just keep moving its way. So if they have to, if they have to head it off somewhere, just yeah. cut out its source of where it's going to grow or where it's going to thrive. Does that work then? No, I, and I don't. Just keep going. Yeah, I, I don't get it. I mean, yeah. that's what they were thinking, and I just. So you have to chop down all these trees everywhere, but we haven't done anything like that here. Yeah, I know you can't. There's no way, and nobody, nobody has the money to do that. No. <laughs> yeah, it kind of makes no sense, no, but. No. But now there's another another critter out now, so the EAB has kind of been pushed down a little bit. Now we got the uh, the, the spotted lantern fly. This is coming out of Pennsylvania, so it seems like one, you know, so now the EAB is kind of, you know, lower priority right now, but um, they're, else, they're still putting out uh, collections for, for the EAB. They put a pheromone out and find where there's a, a colony of, of ash and then they see if there's any there. So they're still doing that and so far we're good here and the lantern fly is not this way yet, but it's coming this way, so. And that affects more maples, so. You, you can't beat that. <laughs> it's like, 
There's always something coming along. Something always coming along. If you look at the bark on it, black oak looks, I mean, it almost looks identical to red oak, if you look at the leaves. But the, the black oak leaves are darker, giving it almost like a blackish look to it. They're darker green, very glossy leaf. Um, and the bark is different. You know, you don't see, this, you don't see the uh, ski marks on it. Okay, different bark. Um, and the cone, or the uh, acorn is a little bit smaller. But yeah, if you saw a small one, you would think it's a red oak. It's really, they're hard to tell the difference. And sometimes they, they actually cross pollinate and you get something in between, so. All right. That's another interesting tree right here. Look at the bark on that. Look up high, it's all shaggy. It's got a, that cinnamony color bark to it. This is a little uh, lilac collection in here too. All different types in here. This, that's a tree lilac, that's called Syringa persica. Um, and it gets that typical, that kind of habit with the, uh, the bark peeling away, that cinnamony bark. Um, it gets a white flower, kind of an open, upright flower on it. And we have uh, another one in the, uh, in the lilac garden, the formal garden down below, um, which was doing very well. And then it got hit by a maple, uh, by a pine tree that came down from one of our microburst storms we've had. And it chopped the whole side out of it. But it's, it's a small one. It's called China Snow, which has a whiter flower. That's about the difference of it. Now, these are all uh, sergeant cherries. Uh, I planted these here. There was, uh, if we look back on the old plans, there was rows of different types of flowering trees through here. Um, so these were, these are sergeant cherries, which bloom early. They get a, a pink flower. And it was also going this direction too. These are sergeants as well. Um, at the nursery, I, I wanted fastigiate forms, which are, they grow like this, upright. <laughs> and when they're young, it's hard to tell. I mean, they, they, they told me that they were fastigia. And these, some of them kind of are, but some of them aren't. I mean, so I, like that one down there, they're not what I wanted, but uh, you know, but that's point, it's, I'm not gonna take them down, but. So these were, these were uh, supposed to be, I wanted the upright form, more tighter. But, and then, you know, the other issue is this big old ash tree right here, which was existing already. So you kind of see it uh, kind of bending out, but. Uh, but in the springtime, it's very nice. This is all pink as you look from the from the road down this way, lined with pink, and then this way. This way, I wanted the form to be to make like a canopy going through here, because then you have the uh, statue of Diana at the end there, and you had the canopy of the pink flowers draping, you know, across Jupiter tree. Now, not really, but. I, <laughs> This is that that other thing is part of the other uh, uh, what do you call it the uh, solar system. Uh, there's you know, just stationed all the way down through here for like you know just to learn about how the distance is between the sun and the planets. Anyway, that happened to be put right there only because it's it's out of the way where a lawnmower or something's not going to run it over. So I kind of put it where they're not going to do that. Anyway, that's a nice, that's another uh, nice shagbark hickory right there. Yeah, right here's another ash right here I planted. I don't, yeah, seemed like yesterday again. Uh, I forget when, maybe six years ago or something. Um, this is a this is a white ash. It's is a Fraxinus americana. But you can see this is you can see where the graft is here. It kind of bowls out. This one is a, was it was grafted because of the, of the, uh, the fall color. This was called autumn purple. So it gets purple, the, the leaves turn purple in the fall. So um, I was tr I was trying to create more shade for. We lost a bunch of trees through here uh, to give the do the uh, rhododendrons and things a little more shade in here. So this should get very large, unless the EAB has something to say about it. But you no, know, I don't think so. But it'll be fine. And then we're coming into the uh, Rhodey Hosta area here. And there's some neat trees I'd like to show you. And then we'll... <clears throat> we hadn't looked closely at the flowering dogwood. You can all come on and find it.
You see a lot of tags in here. Those are all hostas that are taking a nap yet. So um, they, you know, people just see these, they start walking in and stepping on things. And so anyway, we had, uh, I haven't showed you any. The, this is a flowering dogwood right here. This happens to be a pink form, which is uh, uh, Cornish Florida rubra. So rubra would be the cultivar. It's got a pink, pink or red flower. And the flowers on, on the uh, native kind of have to, this is the flower bud here. It's kind of round and it looks like somebody sat on it and squashed it down flat. Um, so these are the ones that have the, you know, the large bracts. This is pink flowers, um, typical habit of, of the flowering dog, which is our native. Okay, and then we have, that's a real old one right over there, an old gnarly one that's been still alive. It's one of those hollow trees, just like the, uh, the hawthorn that we saw. Um, it's kind of neat, you know, and it'll actually shoot up some new growth. We kind of kept it, you know. Um, it still flowers profusely every year. And then we have another newer introduction of dogwood, which is this guy right here, and I have several of them in here. Um, you can see there's a graft again. You can see that line there, okay. Um, what they did at Rutgers, this was Dr. Orton, uh, they took the two species, they took the Cornus Florida and the Cornus Cusa, and they crossed them. And you get these, what they, they call the Stellar series. Um, I forgot, the tag fell off of this one. I forget which one it is, but there's a whole bunch of Stellar series, like Aurora and uh, Galaxy and all those kinds. Anyway, it's kind of got the attributes of both. It doesn't really have as, the exfoliating bark is not as pronounced on, on the Stellar series. Um, the flowers are, some can be quite large. Um, so it's got the kind of the attributes of both in it. Um, anyway, this is, this is the Stellar series, which you can get in the nurseries nowadays. It, uh, yeah, that's right, it blooms sometime in between the two, because you have this one blooms earlier than the Coosas bloom much later. So yeah, this will, so you kind of have a continuation of bloom in between. This is one we just went past. Right here? That's a Camisipris gracilis mena, which is uh, a <laughs> Hinoki cypress, basically. It's not an arborvitae. No, it's, a, no, it's not arborvitae. Is a cedar tree different from arborvitae? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, or false cypress, they have this false cypress, yeah, this get very confusing with arbs and, because arborvitaes are thuja, and then there's, there's suga, there's camisipris, there's <laughs> cypress, there, it, it, it really gets confusing. So it's a cypress. This is a, yeah, well, that's a false, that's a false cypress. Oh, false. So it's really not. Yeah. <laughs> but it's called Hinoki cypress. It's very simple. <laughs> okay, in here, uh, you can see the big stump there. That was a very large specimen of, of Stewardia, which had beautiful big flowers on it, as a white stamens and then these big white petals, and probably an inch or three inches sometimes in size. Um, beautiful bark, exfoliating bark, like you would see on the, like the Parodia persica or the Coosa dogwood, but it, even more pronounced. Well, that, that came over in a heavy snowstorm. It just ripped right out of the ground. So I couldn't save it. Uh, I did save the wood on it though, but uh, anyway, the tree on the outside of the fence is a Stewardia also. But look at the bark on that. That's a, that's a cinnamony bark. It's Stewardia monodelpha, different species. So thus it has a different bark habit. Uh, the flowers, the leaves look the same. The flowers on the monodelpha is smaller than the flowers. They look the same, but they're smaller, like half the size of the Korean uh, Stewardia. Then, since those two are so close together, we're getting all these hybridized seedlings here that are kind of the cross between both of them, which now they named it. It's called Henry I, I guess. I don't know why Henry got in there, but anyway, there's there's all those seedlings growing in that and in, in underneath the understory there, and these are seedlings, um, and you get kind of the it's kind of inferior to both, really, but it's a small flower. But I'll show you one that we put down in here, which is the Henry Eye, which is down in the, and it actually looks quite nice with all that bark peeling off of it. It really, it's quite showy. So, and this stuff in here is all epimedium, which we have to really, you know, just slightly rake it out. But then there was all these hellebores in here, which were kind of buried in the leaves. 
which I have to get back to work on that. So there's all different kinds of hellebores or Lenten rose you know, planted in here. And yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, like over here, they burned that earlier, but it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, the, the weather wasn't quite right, so it didn't burn very well. Mahonia. This Mahonia bealii, or uh, well, it's called grape holly. Uh, it's not really a holly. It's a Mahon It's Mahonia is the is the genus. It's not Ilex. Uh, it's probably it, I, in the family. It's probably the same in the, in the holly family. Um, these are the flowers that'll be coming up soon. Um, very very fragrant. It's yellow flowers. Smells like Lily of the Valley, very sweet smelling. And then once the flowers are done, you'll get a, uh, uh, these bluish grape colored uh, berries on it, which are eaten by animals. Uh, this one, you know, if it's out in the full sun, you know, it'll get like it's on a northern or southern exposure of a house or something. It'll tend to burn because any, any kind of evergreen will do that if it's, because you get that fluctuation in the temperatures, you know, during the day, well, like, like I say today, it's got nice and warm and, and everything, the, the, the sap starts flowing, the water, you know, fluids moving in there. And then as soon as the sun goes down, the temperatures drop and freezes all that fluid in there and then you get a burn. So this placement of these things like to be, uh, you know, kind of guarded from that or, you know, at least sort of out of wind and that kind of thing. Uh, the tree that's over it, this is Nyssa sylvatica. The, it's a, uh, black gum or tupelo, There's a couple different names for it. Um, everybody thought that this one was the weeping form, which uh, according to I couldn't find it to be the weeper. It does look kind of, it weeps a little bit. Um, but I'll show you a new little weeper that I got that's down here. Uh, it's a tiny thing, but it's definitely a weeping black gum. So, you know, this, is a, uh, this is the weeping. So yeah, it's a little guy. I got them last year, um, and it, this, these uh, Nissa sylvaticas have great fall color as well. So there's a bunch of cultivars out of, of Nissa sylvatica. So this one happens to be the weeping form. Um, I'm hoping that I guess, well, I guess eventually it could get quite large, but I may not be around for that one, but maybe. Uh, what else in here? You see the whole place is surrounded by, we have all these Norway spruces. Kind of gives you a whole wall back here. So it kind of protects us. This gets pretty warm in here in this area. You can see really right now it's kind of protected. Um, so this area was originally the, was planted as the moraine garden, uh, which had water flowing underneath these, these beds here originally. And that whole system rotted away, I don't know, back in the early 60s, I guess. So we never, we never used it after that. Um, so it's kind of more like a rock garden. It was turned into like a heather garden for many years. And a lot of the heathers, they require a lot of work because they do, you know, they, they kind of fill the whole bed. And then if you have a harsh winter, they all die, tend to die back. So we have some heathers and heathers and heaths kind of scattered through here still. Uh, but I'm kind of making it more like a, a rock garden or alpine type garden with, you know, the, the way the soil isn't here, it should be uh, a lot of sand or, or um, grit as far as like gravels and that kind of thing to let the water flow you know it's very porous okay that's more for what like alpines like um, so we have a lot of different types of alpine perennials things like that bulbs things like that here as well first <coughs> taxonium disticum it's uh it's called peeve minuet or something like that Min minaret, minaret. Yep. do you pronounce the t at the end of that or not is that a t French name? Well, I, I, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's like Pinot Grigio. Anyway, uh, it's a, another grafted. You can see there's a graft there. See where that the scion and the have fused together. This one it has a different form. It kind of grows. When we got it, it was a little guy. It grew very quickly. It kind of has a. It goes out and then it goes up. Uh, it's supposed to be more of a dwarf. Okay. So we have more of these guys, and actually it's starting to, you can see a little knee pop up here and there, okay, already. Gets, you know, when it gets, gets a little water down here. But as you walk down into this path, takes you to the bog pond, there's several uh, taxodiums in there, 
uh, pond cypress, those, and then uh, I don't think there's a, there's no dawn redwood, but well, there might be one dawn redwood down in that direction too. Um, but that's more of a, a boggy area through there. And then you'll definitely see the knees popping up down in there because if they're in a wet, they're in a constant wet area. And they'll pop those knees up so that they can breathe. Okay, because it's no, you don't get it. Once you have water on the ground, there's no air penetrating through the soils anymore because you have that water there. So they actually get a little more air that way, they pop up those knees. It's not for structure as far as holding it up or anything. And then right behind us is another weeper. This is a, this is a, uh, a river birch, which is Betula nigra pendula. Um, let's see, it's, it's, it's slightly different. It gets a more exfoliating bark on it. Uh, it'll, it'll grow in wet areas. I mean, most birches will survive in wet areas. Um, I have another uh, straight over that way, which is the form. That's uh, Betula nigra, but it's a cultivar called uh, Heritage uh, because of the, the exfoliating bark on that. The bark is more cinnamony colored than the species. We have some old species trees down in the back by Swan Pond there in a grouping. There, the bark is not as, it's more gray. It doesn't have that, that nice uh, brownish color to it. And then we have this guy right here, which I'm very happy to see it's doing very well. Huh? Yeah. This is a uh, Franklinia. And you gotta place it just right, because it, it's, um, it's a plant that was, this, uh, there's a whole story behind this tree. It's, it's, it's the only one in its family, this species, this Franklinia um, Altamahaha. I can never say that right. Altamaha. Yeah. Altamaha is the name of the river, which is in Georgia, where this tree was found growing uh, by John Bartram, who was a horticulturist botanist back in the 1700s. Uh, he had his place in Philadelphia. He was best friends with Benjamin, and he named it after him. That's where the Franklinia came from. And then when they went back later on to try to find more, they, they couldn't find any more. So, the, so he was basically the guy that saved this plant. So it's a very cool tree. Look at the bark on that. There's somebody skiing on that too. So you see the striations in there. Um, these are the seeds from last year, the flowers. Um, the, the flower buds are uh, these guys, these stubby. They're, and they, they, they bloom in the late summer. So. And it has that, it looks like a, the uh, uh, Stewardia flower. It gets a, a white, the white uh, stamens in the center and anthers. And then you have these white petals around it, very showy in the summertime with the, with the leaves. So, and it's a small stature tree. Um, the way it's placed here, we get the water coming through here. It's, it's a wetter area down in here. So it's not quite in a river, but it, you know, it's not like, basically we're near the edge of a river. It's very, very soggy through this area down here. So it did very well, because I planted a couple. I tried one over there, you know, this one, this one did very well. So it's been here for probably 10 years or more. So doing very well. So if you're down this area in the summer, that's, there's very few summer blooming plants, so. This is that uh, other Stewardia. This is that Henry eye. And when they're younger, this is getting, you know, much older now. It was just kind of had this color to it. It wasn't flaking as much. But I mean, this year, I mean, it's really, it's beautiful. I mean, it's just, it, it's smooth. Uh, so the bark is very nice. I mean, the flower again is, is so, so, so. But I mean, just to look at that with the bark, it's nice. So nice winter interest in that tree. And I, I'm assuming it doesn't get quite as big as, uh, well, they're both fairly large trees, so. So that's a Stewardia. And the way they would do with this one, they just put an X and then it's Henry I. They don't go, well, Stewardia, Pseudocalmia, cross Monadelpha, you know, and then put the cultivar in there. They just put an X there, meaning that it was crossed by two different species. So, okay. Another bald cypress right there, right on the little stream right there. Oh, they get quite large. And you can see the cones up there. 
So that's why it's, it's, uh, it's a conifer, but a deciduous conifer. And then that little tree behind it there that's very tight, that's an old tree. That's been there. I have pictures of it, you know, back in the 20s, and it was almost that big already. That tree back there with the real tight, tight branches right next to each other, that's a pond cypress, which is a Taxodium ascendens, and that's a cultivar called Newtons. And it's very tight, upright growth on that. And for years, it got all overgrown with a lot of ash trees and everything. We cleared it out many years ago, and it's very slow to fill in, uh, but it's, it's still doing very well. Uh, Picea orientalis, so you saw the original one. These I bought at, at a nursery. Uh, actually, this one came from a, a gentleman's property. This one was very low. If What's that? Yellow. And very yellow. It's very sunny here, so that's why it does very well. Sometimes if they don't, if they don't, if they grow them from, from cutting, um, if they don't stake them, they tend to grow more flat. A lot of times I'll have to stake them for a while to get them to grow tall. This one was kind of just let to, so it's now starting to shoot up a little bit. So I just want, I put the two together kind of thing. So it's just to show that what happens sometimes. But yeah, and again, it's sunny over here. If you go on this side more, it doesn't get quite as much sun. It gets more green. Another one, of, this is one of the big white oaks. It was like these two twins. There's one here and there's one right over here. The stature of those trees, it's, it's a, they're beautiful. Uh, in the fall, they get a nice russet color leaf. The leaves turn russet color. Um, just, just gorgeous trees. And they're, they're allowed to give, you know, just really spread. They got a room here to spread. That box that's on there is for bats. This is the other uh, Clethra. This is how the, this has, the, I showed you that Barbara Nervous, which is, was kind of dying, which is a Japanese. This is kind of flower would get, these are the seeds, kind of like uh, droopy flowers. This is Olnifolia. They kind of get about, this is about the height of them, as big as they'll get. And there's a couple smaller ones, there's with pink form called Ruby, uh, but they're very fragrant and they're native. Another one of the uh, Dr. Orton crosses is right here. And what was that one called? Or, uh... Now this one's Galaxy. It's got uh, Cornus. <laughs> Cornus with the X instead of saying, you know, Coosa and Florida. I just put an X and Root Dan is uh, Rutgers something. They, they just kind of abbreviated it. But it's, it's, it came out of Rutgers. I don't. I don't think he's. I don't think he's. I don't know if he's still alive or not. I don't know for sure. Has this been around for a while? Oh yeah, they've been around for quite a while. Yeah. What's that? Brooke's variety doesn't get the anthracnose. Yeah, that's, that was that was the main reason why he was doing it. Yeah, I should have brought that up too. They're very good. Yeah. Brooke is great. Another. Uh, Cornus, this is the Cornus uh, alternifolia again. Okay, so again, it had that nice, the nice habit with the, the burgundy stems. This one is the specie. Yeah, they're doing pretty right, good. Yeah. One other big tree is this one here. Mostly this in here, there's white oak, red oak, Pretty much this all there is, white and red oak kind of in here. This tree here is a, a Kentucky coffee tree. And you see how these very stubby kind of branching on it. Um, and these get gigantic. These will go 100 feet. Um, we have a big one on the other side of the uh, manor house in the winter garden on the edge of the lawn there, which is a trunk like this big around. Um, they do get very large. They get a pod on it, it's a brown pod, like chocolate colored pod, has a few seed in it. And it, it used to be used for coffee, that's why I call Kentucky coffee tree. It was a cheap, cheap substitute for coffee. Um, gets these huge leaves, they're, they're bipinnately compound. So the stems are here. Sorry. This would be the stem, actually it's a little bit longer than that. You'd have, 
uh, stems coming off of this stem. And it would be compound, but they're by, because I'm off these little stems, and it was, another, it was like this big, by the time you got all that together, they're big, huge uh, leaves. But they're kind of, you know, they're, they're smaller leaflets on there. But, uh, so very large leaves, um, and uh, it's, a, it's a native, obviously. It's, and even, it's interesting in the wintertime, you got that coarse habit. This, uh, this is the perennial garden, and the trees in here, uh, these old ones, which they've been slowly dying out, these are Prunus and Sisa, uh, which the common name is like mountain cherry. But these get, I mean, little tiny flowers, but they're like a pinkish color. I mean, just this tree, the canopy is just full. It looks like a cloud, you know, so that's, so it's Prunus and Sisa. The Sisa, I guess, the, I, I can't seem to find that particular species anymore. They've started crossing it with another one, which is called Okami. And now it's called Okami, so it has a, it's, it's a more uh, improved variety. So it's hard to find sometimes these old species anymore because they've crossed them and then nobody wants to grow them because it's not a, you know, not something that's popular. So anyway, so these are, these will be blooming early too. So, so the new ones up there are actually Okamis, which is the parent is Incisa, and I forget what the other one is, but. Anyway, all right, we're going to head out the uh, little arbor up here. Yeah. Okay, this is kind of our our witch hazel bed here with all different types in here. Um, you can see there's some, some red ones that are, are, are auburn colored or, or burnt orange. And as you, you should be able to smell some. These have been blooming uh, at least six, six weeks or more. Um, so they're starting to get to the end. Some have very fragrant. See, this one has a fragrance. And I have tags on them in this one. See, now this one's Hamamalis intermedia. And intermedia means it's a cross between uh, the Mollus, which is a Chinese, and the J and Japonica, which is a Japanese. And then our native one, which is kind of like this one here. Which it's Virginiana, and that one blooms in the fall. So, but I think this one reverted because I, I think the the scion died out. They used the understock of Virginiana, which is our native, and the under and the scion part died out, and then the understock took over. And that can happen. So you got to, you know, this one's carmine red. This is again, it's the cross, and then there's some, you know, Arnold Promise, which is a, you know that was came out of Arnold Arboretum which is a bright yellow one, which may be that one, or I know the one that's over on the other side is Arnold's Promise. Big, he's a witch hazel. And they bloom for the longest time. Like I said, it starts in February or so, depending on the weather again, and it's still blooming. So it was, I mean, I was out here early, you know, in the winter chopping some of the dead stuff off, and they were, you know, they weren't quite, they were showing color, but you know, they, they hang in there for quite a long time. Uh, well, to flower better, yeah. I mean, they'll, they'll grow in some shade, but they, they're just a flower. They'll survive in the shade, but. Then you got a real reddish one back there. So these were all hybridized. They, you know, they were crossing them and. But I think it was that the Chinese had more color, the, the Japanese ones had uh, more fragrance, and then they started crossing them to get intermedia. So you get fragrance, big flowers, different color, and they start playing around with those kinds of things. So you get all new hybrids that way. Yeah. All right, and another one of our Skylands, Ori Picea orientalis. That's a copper beach. Yeah. And when you look at that, you got that backdrop of copper. It just like stands stands right out. You know, really nice. nice. So actually, I was up here. The guy from Broken Arrow, he took a picture of it. It was in his catalog. I said, "Oh, that's pretty cool," because because they had. That's a, that's a very nice couple. Yeah, yeah. I said, "Wow, that's neat." So, yep, took a picture. And this is all copper behind it. The leaves on that. Oh. There's a vestigial beach, European beach. So you're going right there, very upright. And then you have a weeping beach over here to the right. That's a weeping beach. 
These are all European ones. The American beech, uh, they've never done anything with, I guess, I don't know, they never showed any promise with uh, any kind of witch's broom or anything like that. That's where a lot of these things come from, is a mutation in the tree. And then some uh, um, enterprising uh, nursery guy chops that, chops that out and starts playing with it and you get a new, whole new plant out of it. That one with the white bark, that one's another one that came out of China. It's kind of a new intro. I mean, it's been a, it's it's always been around, but it wasn't in the states. Um, that's called um, Heptacodium myconoides. It's the seven sunflower. And what what brought my attention was that you know um, I come from a family of seven brothers, so it's like I said, oh, I gotta have that. So anyway, it's. Uh, it has that exfoliant bark. It, needs, it tends to sucker a lot. You can see the suckers in there. They just got to be pruned off. But it blooms in the late summer, um, and then it holds on the little sepals that it, where the flowers were. They turn a bright red, so it's a, it's very showy. So, so that's Heptacodium myconoides, seven sunflower, and you can get that, you know, in the nurseries now too. These two trees. Uh, these are Winter King hawthorn, which is a different species from. The mollus over there, uh, this is Hama, uh, not Hama mollus, Crataegus uh, veritus, uh, winter king. It's called winter king because it, it holds its berries throughout the winter and the birds are, you know, by late winter they're feeding all over and they, they disappear by spring. But it's just full of red berries, small little tiny red berries. And it gets little white flowers, uh, very few problems with it. Uh, so it's a nice, a nice uh, tree for a small garden, it doesn't, you know. This is a uh, this is a um, hawthorn. So it's uh, the family it's in is is in the apple family. So it's quite different from that. But it's a different species yeah. altogether. Yeah. And then right there is a nice maple. Um, that is a uh, paper bark maple. It's very slow growing. Um, Acer grissium. And it's got cool bark on that. Very slow growing. So I mean you could you know I. Uh, we, it used to be in the other area over there. I moved it there. Um, I guess it's about twice the size now that it was. So, and that was 20 years ago or more. So, very, very slow growing. If you want something that's slow growing? Um, that's a nice plant. Oh, it looks like it died probably from heat or something. Yeah. What's that? It should rebound. Oh yeah, it's got all the sides. I don't know what. I haven't hardly noticed that. But. Yeah. Okay, I think we're uh, one. Thank you, Rick. That's another. That's another uh, Camisiparis grissom uh, gracilis. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> another. One.